Hello, and welcome to SETI Live. I'm your host, Beth Johnson, Communications Specialist here at the SETI Institute. Thank you to our viewers from around the world for joining us. Please let us know where you're watching from, and welcome to listeners on the podcast version of SETI Live, available on most podcast platforms. Bill, oh my gosh, I feel like you don't really need an introduction, but this, of course, everybody should know by now is Phil Plate, the bad astronomer who has been communicating and correcting space science um, <clears throat> since the turn of the century. I'm so sorry, but I had to write it that way. There was oh, really no other good way before to Before then, it. since the wild <laughs> 90s, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. But you have a new book. So this is your third one, correct? Um, yes, I self-published a book with Zach Wienersmith about with uh, with nerd insults. Um, but I don't know if I don't know if that one you know counts or not. So this is an official <laughs> third published through a publishing house book. Yes. All right. So your latest book is Under Alien Skies, which I of course have a copy of. Thank you, mom and dad. Um, and you are you have become our tour guide through the cosmos, taking us on a trip to marvel at. And what all you know the wonders of other worlds and distant star systems and and all that kind of thing so so let's talk about this fantastic book um what what led to this one so your your first one you you you've covered sort of like all of these science myths and and bad science that has come up in movies and and tv you've you've covered how we're all going to die eventually um so what what led to this one you, this one seems a little bit more upbeat than the death in the right. sky um <laughs> To be a little more clear, I mean, the first, book, the first book was tackling myths and misconceptions. That one was called Bad Astronomy. The second one, Death from the Skies, was all the different ways that the universe could kill us. And that was um, an excuse to write about stuff I loved, like asteroid impacts and, and black holes and exploding stars. Um, this one um, was really born of people asking me, and I, I got this question a lot, um, you know, when I would show them a Hubble picture or something like that, and they would say, is this what it would really look like if we were there? And the easy answer is no, because you'd be dead. Uh, you know, and basically anywhere you, you, where you're not on Earth, you know, it's not going to be good for your health. But, you know, if you were in a spaceship um, floating inside a nebula, um, would it look like it does in the pictures? And if you were floating around Saturn, would it look like it does in the pictures? And it turns out... Um, uh, that the answer to that is it's complicated. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. And years and years ago, and like 95, gosh, I'd have to, it's in, it's in the book. I talk about it in the, in the book. I don't remember what the exact year was. Um, I decided to write uh, an article called Under Alien Skies for Astronomy Magazine, where I talked about, you know, what would it look like inside a globular cluster and inside a nebula? Um, and the nebula one was, was really hard because, um, the way gas glows, um, our eyes don't see that the same way we see something lit by the sun. It's just different physics involved. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, sometimes it would look really different than what you see in, in the pictures. Uh, and that, that was a lot of fun to write, although it was really hard. And then I thought, you know, this would be fun to expand out um, mm -hmm. and uh, write a book about. And then here we are 30 years later, I finally got around to doing it. Uh, and so that's, that was what led to this is I really wanted to describe what these things look like. And then it occurred to me, it's like, well, what would it be like to really be there? Not just what they would look like, but you're standing on Mars. What does it feel like? What do you hear? What do you smell? If, if you can, that, that sort of thing. And, right. and how would this experience be like? And then it, it kind of turned into a tour book of all these different places. And I had a lot of, a lot of fun writing it because I really pictured myself in these places and said, what would you see? And, and used a lot of physics and math, which, you know, I keep in the background. I don't actually do all the math out. It's like, you know, how would these things look and how would it feel? And, 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 and what would you experience when you were there? So what you, obviously there's, you know, research that goes into doing these things. You're not just pulling it all off the top of your head. I mean, I know you and I, we know we made a lot it all about up. It's actually all right. wrong, sadly. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> we, we, you know, we, we have a lot of knowledge that we, we have sort of like filed away, but there's still a yeah. lot that you have to go and look up. What out of all of what you've covered in here, what was sort of one of the like weirder, more interesting things that surprised you when you, when you discovered it? Um, gosh, there's a lot because, um, you know, not, not everything in the book I learned for the book. 
So for example, um, uh, uh, one of the chapters is visiting an asteroid. And you get this idea that asteroids are these monolithic rocks. Like, you know, you go out in your backyard and you find a piece of quartz and that an asteroid is just like that, but bigger. And it turns out, no, um, smaller asteroids, as, we're, as we've been discovering in the past 10, 15 years or so, um, are rubble piles. They're, they are not solid. It's like, it's like if you picked up a million rocks and just let them kind of hang together in space and just let their gravity hold them together. That's kind of like what they're like. And it turns out that's not even right. Um, they are very, very fragile. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you were to pick up, a, if you were to stand on an asteroid and pick up a rock, a lot of the times you could just crush it with your hands. They're that friable is the word that geologists use. They just, cr they would crush up like a snowball. Uh, and um, that was really shocking. And uh, uh, the um, some of the space probes that we've been sending to small asteroids, like Osiris Rex and right. um, um, uh, Hayabusa 2, the Japanese probe that went to um, Ryugu, uh, they found that yeah, these things are very they're 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 like spun glass. They're just there's there's very little uh, uh, structural integrity there. And one of the probes, I think it was Osiris Rex. Um, touch the surface of an asteroid to collect samples, and really? actually, it, it had a it had a, a long boom with a collector on the end, <laughs> and that thing buried itself in the asteroid. Not only was this not solid, that if the if the uh, spacecraft hadn't had basically reaction motors to blow it back out, it would have mm -hmm. buried itself in in the surface of this asteroid. So uh, that was really surprising, and I thought, well, that that's awesome. I can write about that. Uh, and so I talk about that. I, every every chapter has like a little vignette in the beginning and sometimes throughout the chapter. Mm -hmm. Like if you were standing on this object, sometimes it's second person, sometimes it's first person. Um, and in in that chapter, uh, you know, the, the, the opening vignette is this poor tourist finds themselves buried in an asteroid because they approached it too quickly and they thought they could just land gently on it, but instead went right inside of it. And and that's, I mean, everything I wrote is based on the best science I could find. So there you go. Yeah. And, and Osiris-Rex is definitely an interesting one. It, um, if I remember rightly, the the tag Sam, which is the collector, plunged in about half a meter um, yeah. beyond the surface. And uh, and then, of course, we've had all the other shenanigans with trying to get that sample out. Um, yeah. But they, they got a lot of sample, although it turned out a lot of it was on the outside. Yeah. <laughs> So, about 121.6 grams, I believe, is the exact amount, which is a lot. Uh, yeah. So that's that's pretty exciting. And and yeah, I mean that it and it was only approaching at less than walking speed. It was moving really slowly. So it really was like 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 a box of styrofoam packing peanuts. And if you just pushed your hand into it, you'd go right into it. That's kind of like what these asteroids are like. It was, it was, I was part of the the team that was working on one of the teams that was working on uh categorizing the images so you know marking like oh, cool. this is a rock boulder this is a you know a, a crater and it was a lot rockier than any of us expected so you know it was sort yeah. of like we we expected a smoother surface where it'd be like oh yeah here's a perfect place to take a sample and said it was um yeah about that uh yeah. <laughs> good luck um well so, yeah. you know eros the, one of the first asteroids seen up close um had some smooth areas in it but a lot of that is because of the gravity the gravity on these small asteroids is weird. And a lot of that dust didn't collect and it happened to collect in a, in a small region. But, you know, on these, on these weird top shaped diamond, you know, double pyramid asteroids that we're finding, there's no place for that stuff to collect. It just falls into the surface and goes away. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this, it, it could just be that, and I don't, I don't think anybody really knows if there, there should be a lot of dust. Where is it? Is it just below the surface or is it like all fall into the center? And I don't think anybody knows yet. Yeah, so, so I, I I love that we're still we still have things to discover, you know. It for yeah. all the all the all the science and the research that we all do, th there's still so much to to find out. Yeah. Um, and and definitely, I, I'm guessing that your book sort of like really, I'm not going to say clarified that for you because you already knew this, but that there was still just so much, even as you're like doing this one, you're like, wow, that's okay. Didn't expect. Oh yeah. That. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, and and the same thing happened in my in my second book. Um, I kept running up against the physics, and it's like we just we don't know. Uh, you know, it, it, when when just going to Saturn and looking at its weird moons, and it's like we don't know why this one's doing this and this one's doing that, uh, and and what happens when you fall into a black hole. There are there's a lot of hypothesis based on 
the, the rules of science that we understand. But at some level, uh, this stuff is is not terribly well understood. Uh, and what I kept finding too, especially about the black hole one, was um, getting information online was almost impossible. I kept finding tons of contradictory stuff. People saying, you know, people people who know their science saying, well, you'd see this, and other people saying, no, you'd see that. And I have to go to experts and try to figure all this stuff out. It was hard. I, you know, honestly, that that harkens back to one of my undergrad classes was, you know, we were doing thermodynamics and and I wanted because I was doing astrophysics more than straight physics, really, I, you know, I wanted to do something astrophysical. So I said I would do the thermodynamics of black holes. And I, I turned my paper in and my professor said, so did you, you understand black holes now? And I said, I understand black holes less than I did when I started that paper. You know, if it stumps Stephen Hawking, you're probably you know <laughs> going uphill pretty hard. Um, yeah, his 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 reaction was basically, yep, sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and there's 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 that old joke. Was it Feynman who said three people understand quantum mechanics, and I'm not sure about two of them. So yeah, yeah it's it's kind of like that. And it, most of the time, it wasn't so much the physics, is it? We just don't know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like like on Mars. Uh, uh, there's this idea that these dust storms that, that, that arise, um, and there's pretty good understanding of why these things rise up. Um, the small, you can get small dust storms similar to you get here on earth, um, but they can grow and become global. They can be in, in, envelop the whole planet. And there's this idea that they could be generating lightning. Uh, and you see this on earth in volcanic eruptions and you can find those on, online a lot. You, you, it's a huge plume of ash and there's huge, I mean, it's lightning, it's static discharge. Um, could this happen in the dust storms of Mars? And the answer is, eh, nobody knows. So um, writing about that was interesting because there are some, there have been some laboratory experiments showing that, yeah, you can get some, some static discharge and everything, but nobody really knows if they're like, could be big lightning bolts or if, or if they um, just, you don't get enough voltage basically to create those things. So um, in some cases, I had to let my imagination say, could this happen? Let's describe it. You know, we don't know. Some people think yes. So let's talk about that. Other times it's just based on exactly what we knew. Uh, and sometimes it just comes up to, yeah, I, I just don't know. Uh, so I either said that, you know, we don't know, or I ignored it. Um, because <laughs> it's at some point it's just like, this is just going to get confusing if I start trying to deal with that. So, you know what? I get 8,000 words a chapter. That's not a whole lot. Let's put that aside and talk about this other stuff that we can understand. Well, I'm going to welcome in people who are who are watching. Uh, let's see. We have people watching from, it looks like, uh, New Jersey, Michigan, New York, Florida, California, um, Guatemala, Mississippi. Wow. Um, I thought I saw, I thought I saw Brazil. Wow. And, oh, wow. Uh, Texas, Canada, Seattle. Seattle. So yeah, so a lot of um, great questions, or great places. People are watching from Texas. So thank you everybody for coming in. And of course, people are are saying, you know, that people, a lot of people have all of have the books and and are and are complimenting how good they are. Oh, um, well, thank you everyone. <laughs> so, uh, when planning this one out, did you did you have like a strategy for how you were going to do it? Did it grow beyond what you originally expected? So you know, it, you you kind of you end up kind of going out further and further, right? So you, you talk about black holes near the end, and so what, did it become sort of a it's not just a tour of the solar system. I think I need to tour some more things, or was that always sort of in your mind? Oh, I see. Um... What I well, what I did was actually pretty straightforward. I said, you know, what are the places that I would like to see up close? And I made a big list. And then it's like, okay, this one's going to be too hard to describe um, in in the amount of paper I've got. Um, this one isn't interesting enough. I mean, it would be cool, but it's like this. You know, can I write a chapter on this? Mm, probably not. Um, and uh, some of them were sort of, uh, 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 you had to, I had to talk about the moon. We're going back to the moon. In fact, in, in, in less than an hour, you know, we might, might be landing a probe on the moon. Um, and so, uh, I felt like I had to talk about the moon. Plus it's just really interesting. I, I feel that, um, while people who love astronomy and space travel probably know a lot about the moon, um, most people don't, and they don't know that, you know, a lunar day is two weeks long and the temperature swings, are not, you know, it's not like if you stood on the surface of the moon at noon, it would be 250 degrees. It's not how that works. Uh, and, and so 
uh, a lot of people don't even know that the sky in the moon is black because there's no air. So I really wanted to cover a lot of the basics, um, but also talk about stuff that uh, people maybe don't know. Um, what would it be like to, to live and work on the moon? What would you have mm -hmm. to deal with? You have to deal with the regolith, the, the dust on the surface that is um, like volcanic ash and it gets in everything. And if you breathe it in, it can really give you health problems. The astronauts, the Apollo astronauts all complained about it. Mm -hmm. um, and it smells like gunpowder, in fact. Uh, that's, a, that's a weird thing that, um, and I remember I, I, I was shown some lunar rocks and one of the first things I did is sniffed them. And it's like, oh yeah, you can smell it. Uh, so I don't think people know that. So that was, you know, covering that was, was good. And we're going back to Mars. So let's talk about Mars and then asteroids because asteroids were weird. Saturn because Saturn, right? right. Uh, and then um, Pluto, I, uh, I wasn't sure about Pluto, but then I thought, you know what? It's the last sort of object that we've seen up close that's between us and the rest of the universe. So I really wanted to talk about that. Um, and then past that, um, we're learning about exoplanets. So let's, let's put ourselves on a couple of exoplanets, one around um, binary star system, two stars like Tatooine, a red dwarf, because we're learning that these, these kind of small, cool stars are really good at making Earth-sized planets. And with one like TRAPPIST-1, which is this red dwarf about 40 light years away, it could have as many as three planets that are similar in size to Earth in its habitable zone at the right distance where liquid water could exist on the surface. So, yeah, let's talk about that. Um, and then it, it, after that, you know, black hole, sure, inside a gas cloud, sure, a globular cluster because... You know, going out at night and seeing a, literally a million stars. Oh, my God, that would be so cool. And I wanted to do things like, how about in a galaxy cluster or outside the Milky Way looking back at it? And mm -hmm. that I found was like really interesting, but not enough to write a whole chapter on. And I didn't want to have like a, um, a, a chapter where it was just a bunch of different short topic. So I just push those aside. I'm thinking, you know, someday maybe I'll write more magazine articles or something about those, but that's kind of how I did it. And I wanted to move out through the solar system and get farther out and then have the book sort of cut in half and say, okay, now we're done with Pluto. Now we're going out into the galaxy. And I thought that was kind of a nice little intermission. So that's, yeah. that's how I got that way. I, I like, I like the layout of that. It, it definitely feels like that, that sense of a tour, you know, so that's, that that is a really nice aspect to the book and i, I i'm enjoying that that um so well this the subtitle is a sightseer's guide to the universe so mm -hmm. uh, i really did want to say you know we're going to take a tour of, of everything that would be fun to see and and um i that was a that made it a lot easier to write that turns it in from a you know an encyclopedia entry into something where you are there and right. that that's what i was going for uh when it comes to um, sort of popularizing space science, um, what is sort of what are your guiding principles for it? What makes you you know what what makes you sit down and say, okay, I want to explain this to people. Here's how I need to do that in a way that is accessible to you know the majority of people reading it. Right, that's a really good question because that's it's hard to answer because everybody does it differently. But for me. What I think about is um, what excites me, because if mm -hmm. I'm excited and I write in that way, people will get excited. That's just a, a very straightforward thing. You know, when you, you talk about um, you can watch a documentary on something that you may not think you're interested in. But if the, the person narrating it or, or if it's if it's somebody who's hosting it, they're excited about it and they love it and they have a passion for it. Um, that's very engaging. It's very enthralling. So you want to watch. So for me, I want to let that show. Um, and also, uh, I have to think about what people know. You know, if I'm talking about a nebula, do people know what these are? Probably not. They've seen pictures, but they may not know that these are star forming factories or the leftover debris from an exploding star or something like that. So I have to mm -hmm. talk about some of that stuff as well. And And sometimes... And I, and I run across this, I write for Scientific American now. And um, what I'm finding in my monthly opinion pieces is that I have to spend 700 words just setting up what, I'm, my, what my opinion is. And it's like, okay, and now I'm 200 words, here's my opinion, blah, 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 goodbye. Uh, so I have to think <laughs> about that very carefully and balance how much background somebody needs versus, you know, let, let, now let's talk about the topic. And that can be a really hard thing to do. And I still struggle with that. I've been doing this for, I don't even know how many years. And I still like, 
oh, I'm out of words and I haven't gotten to my point yet. Urgh. And I got to go back and, and edit, 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 edit. Yeah, you you are, I, I have a deep respect for you because you are a very prolific writer. Um, I subscribe to your, your newsletter which went from two days a week to three days a week. And and my brain went, how? Like, I I can't imagine. So so what, what turned you on to writing so much? Like, how, how did this become a thing for you? I, I'm sure there are people who, who know the stories, but like, how did you become such a prolific writer? I, I, it was a, a, a few years ago, somebody said, somebody had described me as being prolific. And I was like, what? You know, I've got a friend, Scott Sigler, who cranks out like a novel a year. He writes half a million to 750,000 words a year. And his novels are really good. And I'm thinking, that's prolific. I just, you know, I'm writing 900 words a day or something like that. And it's not, it doesn't seem like that much. And then I thought, oh, but I've been doing this since <laughs> 1998 or something. It's like, oh, yeah, that's a lot of words. Um, when it's your full-time job, I mean, that's what you do. You sit down and you write. And, and a lot of the times, like, like just before we, we started here, um, some news came out that um, uh, uh, they've found really good evidence of a neutron star in the center of the supernova 1987A debris. And this is a star that blew up and the light reaches in 1987. And I studied that object for my PhD. Uh, mm -hmm. And I've written about it about a bazillion times. And you could wake me up out of a cold sleep and throw me on stage and say, give us 30, 30 straight minutes, type 30 on, on 87A. I'd be like, no sweat. Um, the hard part would be you'd have to drag me off stage. So, you know, in an hour, I wrote a thousand words on this. Now, I don't know if they're good words. I have to look at it again tomorrow and edit it. Um, but in some cases like that, it's super easy. And I just have to, I can, you know, I read the paper and it's like, oh, sure, sure. sure. I, it's, I knew all that. Other times, um, it can take me all day to write 500 words because I don't understand this topic. I, I write about sometimes quantum mechanics or uh, geology or some things that just interest me, but that maybe I don't have a huge amount of knowledge. And so I'm reading papers and going to Wikipedia and checking all these references. And then at the end of the day, it's like, I've written 300 words on this. Oh, crap. I got to get rolling. So, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And um, in, in the end... I don't find writing that many words that hard. Some people do, um, and I get that. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> writing is is hard for some people and not for others. It's like anything else. Um, I cannot focus for very long. I, I I wouldn't say I have ADHD, but you know, after an hour, I've got to get up and go out and do something and check, you know, social media or whatever. So you just have to find that balance and, mm -hmm. um, and, and do what you're good at. That's what I tell people. Find, it may not be writing. Maybe it's speaking. Maybe it's recording music. Maybe it's raking leaves. I don't know. But <laughs> you know, um, most people have something that they can sit down and do or stand up and do or whatever. And um, writing is no different. So you know, that's, I, I don't know if that's an explanation. You know, I, I I write a lot because I'm good at writing a lot. I don't know if that's really, if that sounds egotistical, um, but in the end, I mean, that's that's kind of what it is. I you know I enjoy it, and it turns out I'm okay at it. So you know I can do it. So ascribing uh, uh, to the the life philosophy that do what you love and you will never work a day in your life really kind of it does kind of come down to that. <laughs> that is a damnable lie. Um, it is. Um, it is. It is. It's, it, it's true in the sense that, right, right. If if you do love it, uh, if you honestly love it, then it is. It is fun, and you can do it. But it's also, um, you know, when you turn your hobby into work, it starts to become a hustle, and that that's a pain. And you know, as a freelance writer, you know, and I'm always I'm always keeping my ear open for like, ooh, they're looking for something. You know, that that magazine's looking for this. I can do that. And, and you know, when you're you're paying your mortgage piecemeal, it's always an interesting uh, hustle. Yeah. Yeah, I have I have not boldly stepped really fully into that freelance world. Thank you, SETI, for keeping me employed in a way that I don't have to do that. But I do understand. I I do some freelance, and and it's definitely there. There feels like moments where like I love doing this, but I don't like this aspect of it right now. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes it stops. Um, that's happened to me a couple of times where they're yeah. like, you get the phone call, and they're like, yeah, we don't need you anymore. You know, I, I was writing for for sci-fi for years and Slate for years. Mm -hmm. And then I got the phone call. It's like, yeah, we're, you know, we're reorganizing. 
Yeah. All right, bye. Yeah, and, and it's I've, like, I've followed you from platform to platform. <laughs> yeah. That is definitely very true. And it's like, Those oh, were steady no. gigs. Those were really nice. Uh, and so now I'm writing for Scientific <laughs> American and my newsletter. And my newsletter I can do for as long as I want. Um, and Scientific American has been great, uh, very supportive. And so between these two things, I can, you know, eat and, and, and be able to live. So that's good. But you never know when, you know, something is going to, everything's going to collapse. And, and when you look around, it's like newspapers, magazines, online stuff just disappearing. It's a little scary. It uh, is. So I'm always trying to think about what's next. So, so. on that topic, I do want to get to some of the audience questions. Yeah, um, yeah. Because we're kind of hitting that that half an hour. We're going to go a little bit over just because this. I love talking to you. Shock me. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, the two of us. <laughs> we should be on stage together at some point just so that we have like an hour to, to do this. <laughs> That'd be great. Um, okay, so Alexander is asking, or uh, Alejandro, uh, any advice for someone that just finished writing his first draft of a popular science book in astronomy? Ooh, good question. Um, get an agent. Uh, it, it's it, it's this is this is tough. A publisher probably will not look at something unless you have um, either you're a known quantity, like you've written a lot of magazine articles, or you've done a lot of other stuff like that or you have an agent. And um, back in the day when I was publishing my first book, I was pretty methodical about it. I said, you know what? I don't want to, I've got an idea for a book and it's a good idea, but nobody knows who I am. And so nobody's going to buy this. So I wrote magazine articles. I volunteered to write for astronomy magazine. I wrote for sky and telescope and, and, and got my name out there. Um, and um, getting an agent back then wasn't easy. Um, but a, you know, a friend of mine said, who was a writer said here, you know, let me, introduce my agent to you. Getting an agent can be very, very tough, but they are out there. If you look around and find one, um, you're going to want one anyway, because if you want to publish with a publishing house, um, those contracts are written in cuneiform. You, you've got to have an agent to interpret all this stuff and figure out what's going on. So that's what I would say is, is go out there, look, look people up, find somebody, go talk to science communicators who've written books, find out if their agents are, are looking for people and see if you can interest them in your writing and go from there. And you you mentioned that you have self published that you and you and Zach who I got to talk to last month um, oh, have oh, his book sitting on Mars his and Kelly's book great yeah it's great. it's also like this is this my desk has become this like yeah. I just I just have these everywhere I was I was involved with some of the work that they did in there and they they make fun of me a lot in that book so there you go <laughs> it's all with love <laughs> um, so how how what are your Alejandro had a follow up of like what are your thoughts on self publishing like what was the difference there for you. Did it make a difference? <laughs> if you're going to self-publish, self-publish with somebody who has an audience 10 times larger than yours. Um, Zach Wienersmith does Saturday Morning Breakfast Zero, which is literally one of the most popular web comics out there. So his audience was immense. And so uh, it was his, his idea. And I basically approached him and said, you know, this is a book. And so we, we were like, yeah. So we wrote, a, we each wrote a bunch of nerd insults. And he, he knew people, he, he had self-published before, so he kind of knew what to do. Um, I, I might do that again, but it's, it's there, it, it, there's a, when you, when you publish with a, with a, with a publishing, with a real publishing house, like, you know, W.W. Uh, Norton, like I just did, um, mm -hmm. they have staff, they have editors, they can promote this and they pay you up front, which is very nice. Um, you, they, they basically, they take, they say, we're going to pay you this much total. They chop it up into four payments. You know, one when you sign the contract, one when you submit the manuscript, one when the hardcover is published, and then one usually a year later if they're going to do a paperback or whatever. So, you know, that money's you get it right up front. If you self-publish, you have to do everything first. And then you get out there. And if you don't have, you know, a machine, a publicity machine uh, or, or a big footprint out there, it could be tough uh, to get that out there. So, um on the other hand, um, I had to pitch three different things to my last publisher before they bit on Under Alien Skies. They didn't like my first couple of ideas, um, which I think would make, be great books, but it's just not right for that publishing house. Mm -hmm. um, they tend to do, I don't want to say higher level, but but more um, not like sort of jokey. I have a jokey kind of silly book I want to write, and that's not their style. So I may still self-publish that one of these days. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but it just... It depends. There are a lot of different ways to do that. Some people publish them in segments and you can put them in a newsletter or online or on a website or whatever like that. And then once you're done, you put them all together and sell it all together as a book. 
there are a million different ways to do this. And there's tons of information online to, to figure that out. So look it up. You'll find it. Um, I'm, I kind of want to jump into this one a little bit, uh, not necessarily specifically. So uh, Ungimmicked is asking, what would be the impact of discovering microbial life in our solar system? And, and also as a part of that, for you, what is a potential science, you know, astronomical scientific discovery that excites you right now? Like what, what are you excited about that is being done as, as far as, as all of this is going? Um, about microbial life, uh, it depends. If it's like um, the proto molecule in the expanse, that would be terrifying and bad. Um, if you've read those books or watched the TV show, um, very bad. Uh, but more realistically, yeah, if we find, um, you know, quote unquote, simple life forms on Mars or under the surface of Europa, Enceladus, or, you know, on, even on a comet where, where we know that there are the precursors of life, amino acids and sugars and alcohols that you kind of need uh, all this organic material to make life. Um, it's, it would be huge because it, it, what happens is you've cracked the door open on, well, on SETI. Uh, it, we don't know how rare life is. It seems like life arose on Earth really easily. You know, basically our planet had barely cooled off um, before life popped up. And so it seems like maybe life is easy to arise. Um, but we don't know it, 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 if there had been a little more chlorine on Earth or the sun had been a little more hot in the UV or something, maybe that wouldn't work. Maybe it would. The problem is we are, we're whistling in the dark here without another example. So um, finding evidence of life um, anywhere else in the solar system would be great because it shows that you don't need Earth-like conditions necessarily. Um, Mars was fairly Earth-like three billion years ago, Earth like Earth is now. Um, so if we find life on Mars, it'd be like, well, that's fantastic. That's amazing. But it, it maybe doesn't answer that question as thoroughly as I would be happy with. And if we found it on a comet or, uh, you know, in the atmosphere of Venus, then you're talking. Now it's like, oh, now we've got a compare and contrast situation going on. Uh, and maybe we can find uh, evidence of life uh, uh, on exoplanets by looking for biosignatures in their atmosphere. Although the science on that is still fairly preliminary. Um, it's just like, like methane on Mars or a lot of these other things. Uh, geological processes can create a lot of stuff that looks like life. Phosphine mm -hmm. in Venus's atmosphere. That was a, a big foo for about that a few years ago. Uh, and now it's like, well, mm, it's not even sure they found phosphine. And even if they did, it could be volcanic. So uh, it that's tough. But again, that's the that's sort of the the big one. If we find life in our solar system, that door gets cracked open. If we find it someplace else, boom, doors wide open. And that is that, you know, that that sort of divides human history into the time we were alone and the time we're not. So it's, it's a big deal. And, and obviously, you know, me being at SETI, it's a, it's a thing I, I hugely hope for. And, and I'm also very excited about the research being done into Haitian worlds um, and, mm, and yeah. seeing, you know, that there's potential there as well. And that we, we may actually have found something, but we'll, we'll see, we'll wait. We have to wait and see. I, that's the astronomy is a very big wait and see yeah. Field. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's not going to be like, you know, some astronaut stumbles on your moss on Mars. It's, it, you know, it, it could be that life is so strange that we don't even recognize it at first. Um, and so it, it, the second part of that question is um, uh, what excites me right now? And the answer is mm -hmm. everything. Um, yeah. I like all, all everything going on in astronomy. I get happy about, but I, I still am just thrilled about exoplanets. Um, this is a field that did not exist um, uh, when I was in grad school for my first few years, and then the first planets were found um, right around the time I was starting to work on my PhD. So that was pretty amazing. Uh, and I've, I've been able to watch this field evolve and turn into what it is today, which is incredible. Uh, and the kind of things that we can do now um, are science fiction compared to what I would have thought 30 years ago. Uh, and so it's, it's pretty amazing. And, and it's like, what, you know, what are we going to do next? What, what are they going to be able to say? Oh, we can do this and this and this, and it just will blow your mind. So, um, that's the overlap between looking for life and just, you know, we have to find planets first kind of, uh, to do that. So every day I could do nothing but write about exoplanets and be, be thrilled, be happy. 
Um, but the good news is there's other stuff for me to write about and people won't get bored with me going, Oh my God, we found a planet like this, you know? So I, I do love how we have gone, uh, in when it comes to exoplanet research from, Oh my gosh, an exoplanet. Oh my gosh, another exoplanet. Oh, look at an exoplanet too. Okay. Like, yeah, there's like almost 6,000 exoplanets, yeah. but this one is weird. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, you know, it, so it, if there's a press release, there's something funny going on. Yeah, it was, it was every, every now and again, they say, you know, some paper would drop and say, we've, we've found 30 exoplanets. Everybody was like, oh my God. Uh, and now it's like, yeah, 30. Oh, that was yesterday. Um, and so, yeah, the, and this is something I, I've, I've been talking about for years is that watching the exoplanet field get, get expansion get, as, mm -hmm. as they were finding more and more. And I started to realize um, this is turning into it's it's changing from stamp collecting where you just like oh here is a thing that we can now look at to to having um, zoology where you have enough examples that you're starting to see trends mm -hmm. and 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 some of those trends at first were like is this real um, or is this just you know you flip a coin three times in a row and you get three heads it's like is the coin that or is that just a one in eight chance uh, and and so now it's like whoa yeah we're not seeing planets of a certain size why mm -hmm. is that. Uh, and then there were these two ideas. Uh, and then it turns out, yeah, one of the ideas predicted something that turned out to be the case. And so now it's like, that's why we don't see planets that size. I won't go into details now. But th the point is, the point I'm making is that, yeah, it's amazing that we're looking for trends. Um, we're trying to, and when some planet is really weird and stands out, it's like, ooh, why is that? And you, if you find 10 exoplanets, you're not gonna find ones that have a one in a thousand chance of existing. But if you have 10,000 of them, you're gonna find 10 of those planets. So the more you find, the, the weirder ones you get. And so that's, that's, that's turning into the fun now. It's like, oh, we're finding planets in trinary star systems. It's like, ooh, that's neat. How does that work? And, and so that kind of thing, that, that is, I love when papers like that come out, I'm like, oh God, just into my veins, please. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's 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 definitely a. Uh, I I would like to know more. Um, what what is this? Please please send me all of your research on exoplanets. Um, I will read about every single one you find. Thank you. You need to have Jesse Christensen on this podcast. I, I, I think I'm pretty sure we have before, but I would happily have her back again. Okay, yeah, she's great. She's the queen <laughs> she of exoplanets. Is. That's what I call yes. her. She's great. She's yes. really funny. We're old friends. She's a big Star Trek dork like I am. So. And, and think, she's I, in charge of the exoplanet database. So she knows about all this stuff. I, I think we all are Star Trek dorks in some way. So yeah. um, just, just going to leave that out there. Uh, well, okay. It is it is well over, well past three o'clock now. This has been wonderful. And I could, again, oh. sit and talk with you for another 20 minutes easily. Um, but there is a landing possibly happening on the moon. Uh, so that is the intuitive machines. Uh, Odysseus is getting ready to do the thing. And so I don't want to keep everybody here when we could go watch right. that. Go, go watch so, a moon um, landing, the first American moon landing in 40 years. Phil, thank you 50. so much for being here. Congratulations on another book. Um, I am I am thrilled to have this, add this one to my my rapidly growing collection of of uh, space and astronomy books. Um, so much fun. Well, thank and, you. Um, I appreciate it. Yeah, please come back when, when you know, whenever. Honestly, I, I'll Anytime. happily have you on whenever you feel like it. Somebody cancel, um, you can call me. All right, that sounds like a good plan. Uh, stick around with me for just a minute after we we end the stream, and uh, so we can make sure things finish right. And everybody else, thank you for being here today, for watching, uh, for hanging out with Phil and I. Um, feel free to put your questions in YouTube. Um, Phil is obviously an internet person, so um, can answer things if you put them in there. I know we didn't get to get to all of the questions. There's some really fun ones going on here, but feel free to do that. And uh, we will be back next week. Um, I will be talking to Ariel Gurikowski about citizen science and comets. Um, so we're, we're gonna talk about some new unicellular stuff going on. And um, yeah, we've, we've got some cool things happening. I'm still trying to work on getting uh, the mission director for Intuitive Machines, hopefully sometime in the next month, we'll see. Um, and, and Phil, good luck and congrats on the move, congrats on the book. And uh, we'll see everybody next week. Take care, everyone. Right. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.